and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Uh, today's episode is a little different. Uh, we're going to be experimenting with all sorts of different formats in the coming weeks and months. Well, months after the summer break. But uh, to finish off this year, uh, before we enter our summer series, which uh, we'll look at, uh, pull out the favourites of the last uh, two or three years of podcasting, uh, I wanted to try this as a different format where we are going to deal with, where I'm going to deal with uh, a few different stories and uh, share with you, if you're listening to this on audio, uh, it will work of course, but we are moving on to the video format as well and our YouTube channel is gaining a lot of views, so I'd really invite you to join us on there. But the first uh, part of, of today's episode, I wanted to talk about a story related to COVID. What a surprise. What a year it's been. Um, and to say it's been an unusual and exceptional year is an understatement if ever there was one. So the first story is one about COVID. And uh, that the, the title of this particular section, and I'll give you the link to the news story on the ABC News, it was called COVID patient with sepsis makes remarkable recovery following megadose of vitamin C. Now, this story, uh, I'll, I'll go through it. I think it's very interesting. And I think there are just some so many interesting insights here as to how we approach chronic disease in our community and how so-called experts deal with the complexities of disease. The second story, uh, I think it's fair to say the word polarisation has come, uh, been front and centre of our minds, particularly in these last few years, uh, and particularly in this last year where the, we have all been exposed to the American election. And it's interesting uh, to note how much calmer I feel that I don't have the noise of the President of the United States, Donald Trump, in my ear every single day. But in this period of polarisation, I've picked a story um, which is all about reconciliation and you couldn't get two more extremes. It is the meeting of two fathers, one who was the father of a victim of a bombing at a concert in Paris and the other, the father of the perpetrator who blew himself up and how they met and what they learnt from that meeting. And I think you couldn't get a more extreme example of polarisation and there was just such important lessons to be learnt from that. And the third story is one that I think we've all come to learn about in this pandemic. It's certainly one that I have uh, and, and I'm sure almost everybody else has too and that is the importance of connection. The importance of connection. And, um, and that is face-to-face, real-life connection. And this is a story about loneliness, and it can be counted by how many neighbours you actually just interact with. And it, and it opens up that whole story about isolation, mental health, and how we can overcome that. So I'm going to deal with those three stories. Uh, and as I said, you can look at this on YouTube, or if you're listening to it, it will work fine. The first story. COVID patient with sepsis makes remarkable recovery following mega mega dose of vitamin C. A young Australian man who was critically ill with COVID-19 and suffered early stages of sepsis made a remarkable recovery after being given massive doses, doses of vitamin C, according to his doctor. Doctors, Professor Rinaldo Belomo, Director of Intensive Care at Melbourne's Austin Health, said... The 40-year-old's health has started to deteriorate significantly from COVID-19, with the man losing kidney function and his blood pressure plummeting. Sepsis, a life-threatening condition, occurs, which occurs when the body, when the body uh, damages its, its own organs while responding to an infection. It was the starting to take hold of his body and time was running out. We were dealing with somebody who was very unwell. We felt we were in a very difficult situation and the patient's life was under serious threat, he said. Now, it's worth noting that many, many people have died in ICU uh, through this global pandemic and many, many drugs have been tried to save them. But I'll read on. 
Professor Belomo, Belomo knew researchers at the Flory Institute who had had some promising experimental findings using megadoses of vitamin C to treat sepsis. With the patient's consent, with the family's consent, doctors gave the patient the same treatment the Flory researchers had trialled in animals. And there is a photo of Professor uh, Rinaldo Belomo, who hoped that researchers promising laboratory results would translate into a good outcome for his patients. The man was given an initial dose of 30 grams of sodium ascorbate. That's given intravenously over 30 minutes. Then a maintenance dose of 30 grams over six and a half hours. This is the equivalent of 5,000 oranges pumping through his veins, Professor Belomo said. Well, yeah, a lot of sugar in 5,000 oranges, but another story. An over-the-counter vitamin C supplement is 500 milligrams, meaning this megadose was 60 times the normal dose. It's worth mentioning that the recommended daily uh, dose of vitamin C uh, is, I think, around 200 milligrams of vitamin C. Uh, it's incredibly low. Uh, so that is milligrams. This dose that was given is three is 30 grams, which is 30,000 milligrams. So it's a very high dose. Sepsis is a life-threatening condition um, with, that occurs when the body's response to an infection damages its own organs and tissues. Organs started to fail. The patient goes into septic shock. It's the common cause of death in intensive care units and a common cause of death for people gravely ill with COVID-19. Often patients need to have limbs amputated to survive. And there is actually a photo of a fellow by the name of Mick O'Dowd who went from being a healthy sport-loving father to a quadruple amputee and uh, because he suffered from uh, um, sepsis. Professor Belomo said that the patient had, this was the 40-year-old patient in ICU, had a megadose of vitamin C and the changes were, in inverted commas, remarkable. In a short period of time, we saw improved regulation of blood pressure, arterial blood oxygen levels, and kidney functions returning to normal, he said. His temperature also improved. The patient was able to be taken off machine ventilation 12 days after starting sodium ascorbate and discharged from hospital without any complications 22 days later. This can't be true, is the, is the heading of the next paragraph. The Flurry Institute's Professor Clive May had collaborated with Professor Belomo for many years, keeping up to date, keeping him up to date with the promising results they were seeing in the lab with sepsis treatment. He didn't believe us, he said. This can't be true, Professor May said. Colleague Yugesh Langadeva, Dr. Yugesh Langadeva, sent the intensive care doctor's videos of what was happening in the lab. Professor Belomo literally rocked up at the lab door the next day because he was just like, I need to see this for my own eyes. When he came and when he saw it, they were all very amazed at how quickly the disease just reversed by doing this treatment. Now, bear in mind, the Flory Institute, the Austin Health ICU, professor here, professor there, these are two professors with a lot of experience, okay? So, Professor May has been studying sepsis for almost two decades. His research, which has been published in the Journal of Critical Care Medicines, showed giving megadose vitamin C to animals with sepsis could reverse the effects of the disease. This has been going on for 20 years. I've never seen any treatment before this being able to do that, he said. Given this dose of vitamin C is totally revolutionary... I pause there because I'm incredulous and I'll come back to why I'm incredulous. But there it is. This is a professor in a leading research institute in Australia in 2020 at the end of, hopefully, a pandemic, making this extraordinary statement. Giving this dose of vitamin C is totally revolutionary. The response was quite remarkable. He said the function of the animal's heart, kidneys, liver, lungs and brain began to significantly improve just three hours after getting the megadose of the vitamin. 
If the treatment works well in patients as it does in our animal studies, I think it's going to totally revolutionise the treatment of septic patients in intensive care units all over the world, Professor May said. And there is a photo of the two professors and the doctor thrilled when the treatment was successful. That's, that's, that's really encouraging. But he stressed, and this is important now, people with COVID-19 or any other illness should not try the same treatment at home. I mean, to take 30 grams of vitamin C in powder form is, is, it takes, well, I don't think that's particularly good for you. It does need to be done under supervision and intravenous is the best way to do it. But I digress. We don't want people going out and buying 10 bottles of vitamin C and think it's going to solve their problems. That would just make them feel very sick. Here's the next paragraph. Experts urge caution. While the result seems promising, for the seriously ill Melbourne patient and the animal studies, experts said previous studies using large doses of vitamin C to treat sepsis have been mixed. Now, I just want to pick apart that sentence there. While the results seem promising, I think saving someone's life is rather promising. Uh, I think it's more than promising. And particularly after 20 years of this professor doing studies in animals, which would have done the same, um, experts said previous studies using large doses of vitamin C to treat sepsis have been mixed. Um, I would like to see those studies and I'd like to see what they called large doses of vitamin C because to some doctors 500 milligrams or 1000 milligrams is large doses and to others 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 50, 60 grams is not. Professor Simon Finfer from the George Institute of Global Health has been researching sepsis for more than 25 years. So here's another professor. We have seen so many treatments that seem to work in animal models and case reports, but haven't proven effective in big studies, he said. The pharmaceutical, and here is the kicker, the pharmaceutical industry has spent $10 billion trying to find a magic bullet for sepsis, and they haven't done it yet. Um, <clears throat> but also, he said, it was important to keep an open mind. If something is proving useful, we need to conduct trials to determine if there is a benefit or not. A 2020 review of scientific evidence published in the Journal of the American Medical Association found high-dose vitamin C given on its own with or with steroids did not improve significant survival benefit for patients with sepsis or septic shock. Again, I would like to see the doses that were used because, as I said to some doctors, particularly when the recommended daily dose, I have to check on that, the recommended daily, uh, recommended daily uh, dose of vitamin C might even be less. It might be something like 60 milligrams or even up to 200 milligrams. So for, if that's the recommended daily dose, then giving one gram of vitamin C is a high dose. And that then goes into a paper <coughs> looking at high dose, in inverted commas, vitamin C, which... <coughs> is actually not a high dose at all. But anyway, the review found giving both giving high dose vitamin C just in case or as a measure of last resort could have negative consequences such as delaying proven therapies such as prompt use of antibiotics. This is a, an interesting statement. New trial could bring answers. Professor Belomo said many of the previous trials used a low dose of vitamin C used a lower dose, there we go, used a lower dose of vitamin C <clears throat> than the researchers did in both the animal study and the, and the Austin, and that Austin did in the COVID-19 patient. The amount of vitamin C given in this trial was 50 times greater than any other tried for sepsis. So there you have it. What is a high, supposedly high dose of 30, mil, 30 grams, well... <laughs> So what they considered, what was, what was giving mixed results, according to the professor who was urging caution, was talking about when they talked about high dose, they were talking about eh, one or two grams a day, and that didn't seem to have an impact. This dose was 50 times higher. Doctors at Melbourne's Austin Health have now begun a randomised control study giving some patients with septic shock a megadose of vitamin C and some a placebo. God help those placebo. Blood samples will be collected to gauge the patient's immune response. Researcher Dr. Yugish 
Lakandeva said the trial would help establish an optimal dose and treatment that could be used by intensive care doctors in treating sepsis sepsis as a potential life-saving option, just like the life that was saved, for patients with multiple organ failure. As for the Melbourne man who was able to walk out of the hospital after the experimental treatment, his doctor, Professor Belomo, said it's an incentive to keep trialling this approach. We were encouraged, of course, he said. This has provided us with further ammunition to investigate this intervention, to understand what the mechanisms might be and the extent of the achievement that might come from it. While Australia is doing well keeping COVID-19 under control, he said doctors from around the world have already been in touch to find out more about this megadose treatment. Now, this makes it all sound like this was an absolutely breakthrough procedure. And three professors, one urging caution because the previous studies that have been published on high-dose vitamin C, which, as I've said, again, it needs repeating, those studies were not really high-dose studies because they were probably in the order of 500 to 1,500 milligrams. Um, which is not a high dose of vitamin C, particularly when faced with this, is really significant. Um, So this is not a breakthrough treatment. Linus Pauling, 40, 50 or more years ago, received a Nobel Prize for his work on vitamin C. Many doctors, I'm associated with the Australasian College of Nutritional Environmental Medicine, I have, the, I have the honour this year of being president of that group. I know many doctors who are well-trained and under careful supervision, that's important, have administered IV vitamin C to many patients over the last 30 or 40 years with similarly remarkable breakthrough results that were achieved here in December 2020. And here is the most important aspect of this, because... Remember, we've seen three professors who collectively have spent 50 years or more doing research to find the magic bullet, which the pharmaceutical industry has spent $10 billion trying to find, the magic bullet for sepsis. And what if you were a researcher in a research institution looking for funding to do research, not just for sepsis, but for any disease? If you discovered, as a professor with 20 or 30 years of experience, that actually the answer lay in your undergraduate study in second year university when you studied biochemistry and physiology, and then in third year went on to to study immunology, what if the answer was actually something you had studied at undergraduate level but had just thought was totally irrelevant because what you really wanted to do was get involved in some serious research that could be funded by a pharmaceutical industry spending $10 billion looking for a magic bullet for which we already knew the answer, you know, 50 years ago. So this is a really interesting story on so many different levels. Part of my uh, message, and this is what I cover in my book, is that the food and pharmaceutical industry have had an an incredible impact on health and well-being in our community. And they 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 were some great things in the in the pharmaceutical industry. I'm not disputing that. But um, but here is I think what we need to be doing is getting back to some real basics, understanding biochemistry, physiology, immunology, while the world we live in is becoming increasingly more complex, I've said this many times, I believe the solutions are remarkably simple, accessible and cheap. And this is a good example of that. Now, I've written letters in my capacity at the Australasian College of Nutritional Environmental Medicine, together with its founder, Professor Ian Brighthope, and I've co-written letters with him, co-signed them, to um, to the health ministers, uh, both federal and state, and to the TGA and to the emergency, uh, the ICU Doctors Association. And we have been sending letters since the beginning of this pandemic about vitamin C and vitamin D. There's a whole other story about vitamin D as well. Um, that, and, and encouraging the government 
to just use these simple interventions. And what I've got back in response has been, thank you very much, but there's no evidence to show that vitamin C has an effect on COVID-19. Thank you. Um, and then the next day I might read in the paper that we're going to try the uh, BCG vaccine, the, uh, the um, tuberculosis vaccine, because it improves immune function. No proof to show that it... Um, no proof to show that it affects COVID-19, but uh, just like vitamin C, but we're going to spend $10 million trialling the BCG vaccine or remdesivir, an antiviral, or hydroxychloroquine, or ivermectin, or, and so it goes on, looking for these pharmaceutical products, which potentially could be the magic bullet that generates billions of dollars of research money and funds for selling that medication. But hey, why not make, you know, I work in a practice where we call, where we say we are a patient-centered practice, which means the patient is the most important person in that, in that equation. Well, I would love to see a public-centered healthcare system, a healthcare system based on not conventional medicine and alternative medicine, but just good medicine to find out what is the best in all areas, right through from undergraduate training to postgraduate training. And the key, the bottom line, is what is good for the patient, not what is good for the practitioner, not what is good for the research institution, not what is good for publishing research for professors seeking the magic bullet when, they, if they'd paid attention in undergraduates um, university, they would have known the answer to this problem. Or if they just listened, um, then, then many more people would have been saved. If you get a feeling that I'm getting a little bit upset, I'm a little bit passionate about this, hey, I make no apology for it. But this is the first part of today's episode. I wanted to share that with you. Thank you. We'll move on to the second in a moment. Now, one of the challenges uh, in this pandemic, uh, and there have been obviously many, uh, is isolation. And obviously, if you are fortunate enough to have a close-knit uh, group, family around you, friends that you could connect with during this time physically, that was certainly made life a lot easier to navigate through this challenging time. But it kind of highlighted for us all that um, connection is important and that loneliness and isolation, particularly for people living on their own, was or, or, or um, you know, feeling isolated in a community is a really um, challenging thing to mental health. And this story was all about loneliness can be counted by knowing just six neighbours, a study finds. A global study spearheaded by an Australian loneliness expert has revealed knowing just six neighbours reduces the likelihood of feeling alone and is directly linked to reducing stresses incurred by the coronavirus pandemic. The report is the first study that's quantified loneliness across three countries, Australia, the United States and England, and it examined the impact of a four-week kindness initiative by social media platform network. A, a social media platform next door where participants were encouraged to conduct small acts of kindness in their local community. Dr. Michelle Lim of Swinburne University, Melbourne, conducted the study through a randomised control trial in conjunction with Brigham Young University in the US and the University of Manchester in England, and the results indicated small acts of kindness between neighbours have a positive effect on perceptions of connectedness. Shannon Gunston moved to Sydney's western suburbs with her husband at the end of March, just as we were going into lockdown. She arrived in Schofields with no family or friends in the area. Miss, Mrs Gunston had taken a break from work to undergo IVF treatments and the timing of the move coincided with the introduction of the coronavirus restrictions which obstructed her from interacting with new people. Ms Gunston, Ms Gunston joined next door in a desperate attempt for social connection and was surprised with the impact making friends had on her self-worth. Since meeting some of my local community online, I feel much better about myself and I realise it's perfectly normal to feel a bit left out, but there are things you can do to fix it. 
she said. When the restrictions eased, Mrs Gunston set up a weekly lunch club with some women in the community, as well as a local support group for people undergoing IVF. I finally have people I can invite to my baby shower when I get pregnant. I now consider some of my neighbours my closest friends. What a great story. Before the pandemic, Melbourneian Joey Abood spent half his life in Bali, the base of his newly wedded wife and one of his businesses. He, were, he has not seen his wife since they wed in February as she is running their Balinese business from Indonesia. It wasn't until the coronavirus hit that he realised splitting his time from Richmond and Bali had meant he had sacrificed a sense of community. It was extremely hard. Found the, uh, Mr. Abood found the sense of isolation beginning to dominate his interactions with staff at work. I had to open up. I had to open up to them and say, I'm struggling. And that's so important, isn't it? I feel like I've given up on who I am. It was liberating to hear them say, so am I. Uh, you know, so am I, boss. So the reality is everyone struggles with loneliness. Finding new friends in his neighbourhood massively boosted Mr Abood's mood. And I was overwhelmed, he said, by people reaching out in the same boat for, for complete strangers to take the time out of their day just because they happened to live nearby was absolutely special. According to the Australian Psychological Society, one in four Australian adults are lonely and experienced high levels of social interaction anxiety. I think we used to call that shyness, but it's now called social interaction anxiety. At the beginning of the observation period for the study, one in 10 participants said they were experiencing loneliness. By the end, this was reduced to one in 20. The kindness initiated in initiative encouraged random interactions and, as demonstrated by the results, mitigated the participants' loneliness globally. Something as simple as having regular contact with six neighbours where, where they show care and concern was a, has a big effect on perceptions of connection, Dr Lim said. The study indicates the interactions most effective in decreasing loneliness are not actually meaningful experiences with a close friend or family me member, but incidental moments with relative strangers made on a repeated basis, like a local barista or a babysitter. These interactions, known as weak ties, suffered the most during the pandemic. The head of Next Door Australia, Jenny Sager, credits the erosion of weak ties as the reason why next door memberships increased by over 100% during the lockdowns. When suddenly you're home alone and you don't have your normal monthly chat with your hairdresser or daily interactions with the owner of your local cafe, the depression and anxiety kick in and you seek out connections, Miss Sager said. So this is, again, a reminder of something so fundamental and that is the importance of human connection. And it's been so interesting in this pandemic where we have all been moving to being totally preoccupied by our... We're connected with the world, but we're not connected with the person next to us. And that was a trend that was escalating at an exponential rate, I believe, in our community. And this pandemic has come and reminded us of how important actual social connections are and how connecting with our local community is so important. And I think that's a really important message for us all to take out of this coronavirus and also how random acts of kindness, as simple as saying hello, looking someone in the eye and saying hello and genuinely asking them, how are you? How are you doing? Can have such an incredible impact on their lives and on yours as well. So I wanted to just touch on that topic today as well. Now, another issue that I think uh, a word that we've become all familiar with is polarisation. And uh, we've seemed to have become more polarised in our world. We create our own world, we surround ourselves with our own opinions, and we're incredulous that anyone could have a different opinion to ourselves. And I just thought this story just, it's an extreme uh, example of what I guess is polarisation, what could be more extreme. Talking it over, a powerful conversation between a man who lost his daughter 
in the Bataclan, Bataclan terror attack in France and the father of one of the killers. This was a story in The Guardian that I just read today and I wanted to share it with you. The story basically is that uh, Georges Salines and Asdin Amimur both lost a child in the Paris attack of 15th of November 2015. Celine's daughter, Lola, and Aminur's son, Sammy, were at the Bataclan concert hall that night. One was killed. The other one was one of the killers who blew himself up at the scene. Both were 28 years old. And then there is a rather um, sombre photo of the, the girl, Lola's father, Celine, and uh, looking at uh, the father of uh, the perpetrator of the terrorist attack, Azadin. And it says before, and, and what they did was they got together. The, the father of the terrorist wrote to the father of the victim and wanted to meet. Before that first meeting, Celine's, the father of the victim, was a doctor who works in public health and asked Aminur what he wanted to discuss. He replied, I want to speak to I want to speak with you about this tragic event, as I feel that I'm a victim too because of my son. Others would have been shocked, but thankfully Celine's had attended a conference at the Quillian Foundation in London a few months earlier earlier. So um, this was an important breakthrough. And the two of them um, were uh, met and, and found some comfort in that. We still have words, which is the book that was about those conversa conversations, is at its most powerful when both fathers tell each other their family stories. And this is where I think it gets really interesting because when we start talking to people who are seemingly so different to ourselves, we learn that maybe they're not. How they met their wives, how they became a family, each with three children. Both men are Mediterranean, Celine's from Set on the Languedoc, Languedoc coast in France and Amour from Anaba in Algeria. Both are warm and share a very French fraternity despite the circumstances. Amemur, the father of the terrorist, worked hard all his life, first in the film industry on certain films in the 1970s and ran bars in central Paris, owned clothes shops in Belgium, always travelling, an absent father, he concludes to Celine. The book ends with letters from Amemur, the terrorist's father, to Lola, the victim, and from Celine, the victim's father, to the terrorist, Sammy. Uh, our life down here was the one that mattered because it's the only one there is. I feel sorry that you didn't know this. Sorry for you and sorry that you did so much harm chasing after an illusion, Celine writes. While Amamor tells Lola, the victim, your life was stolen from you by a murderous ideology. Did I fail in my job as a father? I thought I was giving my son a good upbringing. I am so, so sorry, Lola. We must fight to make sure that this can never happen again. This is pretty extreme, and one could certainly look at whether an absent father had an impact on a son being radicalised, but that's not what this. why I wanted to draw the attention to this story. The, the reason I wanted to draw attention to it is that even in this extreme instance, the fact that people sat down and talked to each other and found common ground on which they, their lives existed, you know, because I, I'm an eternal optimist and, um, and I believe, despite the fact that we are bombarded by bad news all the time, um, it's, it's constant barrage of bad news. It is so easy to think that the world is, is, going, to, um, is going in a really bad direction. And one could argue that, envir and, and environmentally, I would have no problem with arguing that, and, and health as well, although um, that's a whole other story. But my point here is that I truly believe that the vast majority of people, I would even put the figure at 95% plus, are good people. And the, the people that make the headlines, that make the violence, that, that perpetrate the violence and make the headlines and give us this illusion that we are living in a very dangerous world um, is, is wrong. 
You know, and I think we need to see the, the brighter side of people, the good side of people. And it's interesting to know that there was a study done um, just, uh, well, about a few years back, which looked at the number of people that died globally each year. And the number of people that die globally each year is around 50 to 55 million. I think the last official figure was about 53 million. And in that 53 million, um, 120,000 died of, uh, of um, violent clashes, violent violence, be it in war or through gunshot or violence, accidents, whatever. But, but 120 million die of that. Interestingly, 800 million people die of suicide. So one could argue that you are actually a bigger risk to yourself than any terrorist. And even more sobering than that, uh, something like uh, four and a half million people a year die of diabetes. Uh, and uh, one could then argue that sugar is an even bigger risk than, su than killing yourself or a terrorist attack. So I think we just need to put the world into perspective. And I found this story really inspiring, that such an extreme of of losing a child, uh, you know, a 28 year old and whose son blew himself up to, to do that. And yet these two men met, talked, shared um, their stories and in some way found peace. I, I'm not pretending they'd be the best of friends after this, but, but it somehow made peace with that. So I just thought that was a really interesting story. Look, it's been an incredible year. And that year uh, has, has raised all sorts of challenges for us. I think we have a global community focused on health like never before. And I think that's an incredible opportunity. We've heard the word comorbidities. And if you go back and listen to my Elephant in the Room uh, podcast or watch it on YouTube, I'd recommend that, um, you'll, you'll know more about what I, what I covered in that. But I basically see this pandemic as an incredible opportunity to reset, to rethink the way we live our lives and a great opportunity to reduce comorbidities or chronic disease and future-proof us for this pandemic and, and, and future pandemics which are inevitable. So uh, coming up in this uh, summer break, which is going to go over January and February, December and, uh, December and January rather, uh, we're going to be uh, revisiting some of our highlights. I mean, uh, the podcast I really enjoy doing it. I know I've said this to you before, um, that I get each week to ask people that know much more than me about a particular subject questions, and incredibly, they answer them, and I learn so much from that, and I hope you do too. I'd also love you to go on to iTunes and leave us a review, because we're learning the nuances of uh, how this digital world works, and... Um, my message is one of personal empowerment, and I would like to get that message out to the world. So how about getting on iTunes and putting in some good reviews? Because if I can get up to a couple of hundred reviews, I'd love this podcast to be uh, reaching a much wider audience, which is our goal for 2021. And in 2021, we have got some really interesting, exciting things happening, online courses, E, lots of books coming out. It's going to be a very busy and exciting time. I hope it's going to be a great year. Um, and, and environmentally, this period has allowed us also to have a bit of a rest and see how much cleaner the air can be, how much less we need to travel, how much more our local environment means to us and the people that surround us, how important they are. So it's a real back to basics uh, story, I think, uh, which which I'm learning myself and I hope to build on in the coming years. So thank you for joining me on this podcast. Thank you for following me on Instagram and all those other uh, uh, platforms. And I hope 2021 is a happy and healthy one to you. Until then, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.